Good morning. morning. Join with me in uh, in the Psalm, Psalm 105 is where I'm going to read from. I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, but we'll, we'll read the first 15 verses. In Psalm 105, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in the holy name, let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant He hath made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance. When they were but a few men in number, yea, very few, and strangers in it, when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, He suffered no man to do them wrong, yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Join with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, we uh, are thankful that you have remembered your covenants, Lord, um, that you have um, made, and and we thank you for uh, your grace and your mercy that's new every day, Lord. Uh, We're thankful for uh, the forefathers, as Brother Matthew mentioned, Lord, um, and as, as this psalm uh, mentioned there, um, they might have been few in number, but when you were with them, Lord, uh, your strength was made manifest. Uh, Lord, we thank you for um, this opportunity to meet in your house and to worship you, Lord. Um, we pray that you would uh, bless us to put away the, the cares of this life and help us to focus on you during this time, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would uh, be with uh, the dear minister this morning. Bless him to recall the things that he studied and and bless him with your Holy Spirit um, and bless us to to, uh, uh, have listening ears this morning. Lord, we pray uh, that you would forgive us of our sins and errors and uh, just lead God and direct us for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul, friends take bear me, close or save me, he my Savior makes me all. Hallelujah, what a Savior. several months ago, and uh, uh, Union Church, of course, but uh, uh, since uh, Brother Ben got a hold of me, I've been looking forward to coming and and being with you all uh, here at Flint River Church. Uh, There's a Flint River in uh, uh, South Georgia, uh, but uh, 
There's not a church named Flint River, but it's the Flint River Association down there, a number of churches. Uh, we used to live in that part of the world, and so Flint River was kind of used to it. But uh, anyway, uh, that's just nothing really important, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's Mother's Day. So just a little brief about mothers. Turn, if you would like, to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Here the Apostle Paul is talking to Timothy. It's a second letter he's written to Timothy. And, and Timothy uh, was very close to the Apostle Paul and, and of great help and comfort uh, to him. And he trusted greatly in Timothy. And when he's talking here to Timothy, getting this letter started, he gets to verse 5 and says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that, it, uh, that in thee also. So here we're talking about Timothy. He's talking to Timothy. But it kind of goes to the generational thing, Brother Matthew, you were talking about. But also in the aspect, here's mothers. We got, got his grandmother Lois was, was a, apparently a dedicated lover of God. And she obviously taught her daughter what she knew of God. And her daughter, Eunice, took that and was raised up in it and, and as a dutiful mother taught her son, Timothy. We don't know where the fathers are at, the grandfather or the father in this. They may have been fine, godly men. We just don't know. It's not mentioned here. But we do know that grandmother Lois and mother Eunice were full of faith and taught it to their children. We have three generations there. I don't know what the generational is in your life. Maybe your first generation, but you can start a generational, can't you? Amen. Absolutely. But praise be to God, to good mothers. I had one of the best mothers as far as teaching, loving God. The, the biggest tribute I would give to my mother right now was she never ever felt like going to church was a burden. It was always, we get to go Sunday. We get to go. You know, I hear sometimes folks say, uh, oh, we have to go to church on Sunday. What is the deal? We get to get, it's the eye of the storm that we're facing through the week and all the things that, that may come about, and we get to go on Sunday. So God bless all of you mothers uh, that are here this morning, those that are training up children. I love seeing the children around and, and the grandmothers. Uh, what a blessing. So, Let's go on to the text. Um, in uh, uh, yeah, this that was the positive part. Now we'll go to the the, the down part. I want to talk to you this morning about death. Isn't that <laughs> real sad? That's why I wanted to make sure there was a mother's part in there. You see, <laughs> talk to you about death. Actually, more than death, just talk to you about God makes the dead alive. That's a little more positive, isn't it? Yeah. God makes the dead alive. In this world, uh, we're stuck in this world because it's physical. This is just a physical place. Let me ask this question. Uh, God lives in another world, does he not? The spiritual world. What, which came first, the spiritual world or the physical? It's a tough question, isn't it? Yeah, the spiritual world. But we're so tied to this world, or I am, I assume I'm a little bit normal. Maybe that's questionable. Uh, but, but we're just tied to this physical world. I mean, it's just here. It's, we, we interact with it with our senses of seeing and hearing and smelling and, and, and tasting and, and touching. And we get so tied up in this world. I don't know about you all. I kind of forget there's another world. I really do. But which one's the real world? I mean, really, the real world. That's not this place, is it? It's God's world. I've told my wife, when I die, what I want on my tombstone says, gone to the real world. Yeah, yeah that's what I, I'm going, I'm looking forward to the day of going to the real world. I've uh, lived long enough. Uh, some of the, there's great joys in this life. I don't want to diminish that. But there's also another side that I kind of get tired of. How about y'all? <laughs> a little bit along the way. Well, so here's God living in a spiritual world, a world that is just absolutely gorgeous. It's perfect in, in the aspect of perfection. It's perfect in the aspect of completion. I mean, it's just all there is that we don't really understand. 
uh, or can understand. And there God sits on his throne. And on his throne, it says uh, that it is his throne. It's, it's grace, the throne of grace. And there he sits. And Jesus Christ, sitting at his right hand, ruling and reigning at this present time, right now. And not only that, Isaiah, uh, no, it's not Isaiah. Uh, Zechariah tells us that he is ruling and reigning, but he's also, at the very same time, he is a priest on that throne. So at the same time he's ruling and reigning on the throne of grace, he's also a priest. Well, what's a priest do? He's interacting. He's the mediator between uh, uh, the one and God. And here he is. Do you all have troubles? Do you all have times that you just are frustrated? Or maybe you just ache down inside yourself because you've messed up again. And just say, Lord, I need help. Help, help, I need help. You're praying to your great high priest sitting there on that throne in heaven. And he's doing his thing. He's, he's being a priest, a mediator between God and men. There it is, that beautiful world. Now, before the foundation of the world, God chose how to do this world. And he made this world. And much of this world, uh, in many aspects, has natural examples to teach us the spiritual. We're kind of physical people. Uh, so we need some physical or natural examples to understand spiritual. If God told us spiritual things, we wouldn't get it. So you just find the scriptures just chuck full of this stuff you know, about farming, about cooking, about being a soldier, about uh, 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 keeping livestock, about, uh, 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 you know, maybe an army, uh, maybe a soldier. Uh, he talks about the aspect of, of uh, aboding. You know, my soul is overwhelmed. It's a nautical term. Uh, it's just full of this stuff. And we get down to the idea of death. Death is a part of life in our experience in this world. Uh, probably a sad part on one side of the, you know, that perspective. God's side, the folks are rejoicing when folks die here because the soul's coming home. Well, what can we learn from death and that God makes the dead alive? That's what I'd like to look at this morning. Uh, there's five points I hope to bring across. I hope we can get there. Uh, on the way over here, I changed up the order, so let's see if this will work or not. Uh, my number one idea of death. Well, before I go to the first one, let's just think about death a minute. So what do we see as death? Uh, I don't know about you all. When was the first time you all experienced? Can you go back in your minds and remember the first time as, as a child that death kind of knocked at your door? I mean, not that you were dying, but but that something around you died. Uh, with me, uh, growing up, uh, I, in our family, uh, I was I kind of a down the line for mom and daddy, and my grand, all four of my grandparents had already passed by the time I'm born, because many people I know as children experience the death of a grandparent. I didn't have that. Uh, so I don't, I don't really remember my first experience in death with a person. But I had two really good pets. <laughs> and you can get mighty close to a pet, can you not? Uh, uh, my one pet was a parakeet. Uh, Christina uh, was the name. And, and I remember the day that parakeet died. I just broke my heart. Death. Uh, another one was, was a German shepherd dog I had. And, and it got hit out on the highway and killed it. And it just devastated my life. I was so silly. The hanky of the tears that I wipe my eyes with, uh, I saved that thing for like years. Finally, so well, this is silly. <laughs> What's the point of saving a dirty hanky? But anyway, I did. Well, because it touched my heart, it broke my heart. Death. Was, so, so in that thought and in your minds, with death, what is what is just an absolute fact about death that we have? It's a separation. And can you fix it? Can you change it? I mean, natural death. We, have, we do not have the power, do we? There is no power. Doctors do amazing things, but they haven't brought anybody back to life yet, have they? Uh, I've heard of tales where folks have died on the operating table. 
uh, we have it even within our own family. And, and my mother was, uh, was in the emergency room, and, and, and her heart, they, they was watching the monitor. You know, Elaine and I was trying to get there as fast as we could. We get the call. But getting to central Nebraska from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, you can fly almost to Nebraska. Then you got to get in the car and drive the rest of the way, you know. So, so, but anyway, they said they're in the emergency room and or the ICU and the little monitor, kind of the hospital thing, you know, beep, 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 and the little thing, and it started getting slower. Beep, beep, and then she flatlined. Just beep. She died. They sit there and watch it happen. The doctor was close, and doctor said, do you want to try to do anything? My mother's probably about 90 at this point, and my dad said, no, no, we've decided not to do any extra stuff. She's peacefully passed away, and the doctor steps out of the room, and one of my brothers or, or nephews, I forget which now, uh, went to pray and started praying. Uh, not that mama would come back to life, just that what a life she'd had and to be with all because of the death. But God, in his mercy, is just unreal. Beep. Beep. Her heart started beating again after a few minutes. Well, we show up. You know, here she is. She's asleep. Uh, doctors tell us, you know, as long as she was out, there's a big chance that her mind, you know, might have lost, suffered enough loss of oxygen. We don't know. So I, I volunteered, and I was the one that spent the night with her in the hospital. And the next morning when she woke up, you can see she's confused because she didn't know she's in the hospital. She's looking around, and then she sees me, and she's like, well, Victor, what are you doing here? You know, she you know, you live in Georgia. I don't know where I am, but I'm not in Georgia. And right, praise God, she's got her mind, you know? But, but the doctors, did they bring her back from that death? No. It's God. It's God all the way. God is the one that makes the dead alive. So let's take this look into scriptures about this. So the most obvious one that I can think of, the most famous one, if you want to turn to it, I'm not going to, is John 11 and the story of Lazarus. We all know the story of Lazarus. Jesus and some of the disciples are away a day or two or three journey. I don't remember exactly. They get word that Lazarus is sick and, and Jesus tarries and because there's a point Jesus is going to make. And and, Jesus, and, and Lazarus dies, and they bury him. And when he shows up on the scene, Martha and Mary are there, the, bro, the sisters of Lazarus. Lazarus is close to this family. You remember the different stories of, of, of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus? And, and Lazarus has died. And Jesus says, show me where you've laid him. And they took him out to the, the graveyard, is what we would call it. I, th I don't think it was quite like our graveyards. I think it was more hilly, and, and it was, it was uh, caves maybe that were natural, or they had carved back into the hillside. And they had a stone rolled over in front of the door. And Jesus says, you know, roll the stone away. And they're like, but Master, by now it's the fourth day. He stinketh by now. You know, the body... Uh, decomposing is starting to happen. He's dead. Is there any question in any of y'all's mind that Lazarus was dead? I, I don't think, uh, not in mine. No, no question about it. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And the scriptures say, and he that was dead came forth. He was wrapped in, in, in uh, uh, grave clothes. My understanding of grave clothes in, in the scriptures at this time and in, Egypt, in, in, in Israel, they wrapped the body from head to toe with a thin cloth or, or narrow cloth and, and the arms and legs were, it was one unit like a cocoon. We all get the picture of the Egyptian mummies. Uh, they're wrapped uh, with the extremities or the arms and the legs separately. But, but in, with, when... Uh, in Israel's, it was more of a cocoon, one wrapping like that. And he came forth. I mean, here he was, alive. It's just uh, God makes the dead alive. Any question about it? Uh, think about Jesus Christ. Uh, there was that widow woman and her only son. And, and, and probably, since she's a widow, we know, we know her husband's gone. I don't know what her income is going to be. 
Uh, women in the time of the scriptures uh, weren't really the ones that provided the living for the family. And here she is uh, in, in sadness and, and going out to bury her son. And Jesus shows up and puts his hand on the, on the casket or the, the, you know, whatever they're carrying him out with and called the boy back to life. Broke up a funeral. Isn't that lovely? But only God can do that. God did that. What about J. Iris? I love the story of J. Iris. It's, it, it's humorous to me. Uh, maybe, maybe I look at things crazy. But, but uh, here's J. Iris comes to Jesus. And, and he's, he's just heartbroken because his daughter is so sick and knows that she's about to die. And says, Jesus, if you'll come, you can heal her. And, and so as they're going, and there's this throng around, around Jesus Christ as they're going, and the woman that had the issue of blood for so many years uh, uh, comes to this group of people as they're heading to Jairus' house. And, and, uh, and she just in her soul and her mind said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I mean, just, just the edge, I know I'll be made whole. And she gets close enough to do it. And Jesus, and she's made whole by her faith. And Jesus says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, are you kidding, Lord? Who touched you? There's all these people bumping into you. And, but remember now, Jairus is standing over here. And the whole group stops. And Jesus starts this lecture with, with this woman. I just, got, I just imagine Jairus is just like, come on, come on. Let's, I know how I would be. I mean, I don't have time for this, folks. We, you know, I'm self-centered. I'm a, you know, I don't ask how you're doing usually. If I do, I'm just waiting until I can get to my time to talk about how I'm doing. All right, that's kind of the way I am. And here's Jairus, and I ain't doing well, Lord, and let's get this show on the road, you know. And they came and told Jairus uh, that her, his daughter had died. You reckon hope just poured out of him? It's over, my daughter. Because what Jairus know? Death is permanent. We can't fix it. Death is permanent. And here they've come and told him, and his heart had to sink. Jesus says, let's go on. She only sleepeth. J Jesus looks at death a total different way than we do. We're here in this natural world. Remember the world he's from. Remember the world he lives in, spiritual world. Things aren't the same there. And they go, and as you know the story, raised, raised up a Jairus' daughter back to life. God, Jesus, makes the dead alive. So I think that's pretty well founded. I don't think I need to labor that point anymore. God makes the dead alive. So let's look at, uh, at another idea. This is a little bit remote, uh, Romans 4.19, but it still carries this point. Romans 4.19, talking about the faith of Abraham here, and it comes down to where y'all remember that God had promised Abraham over in Ur of the Chaldees that he would, have, uh, a, he would be the father of many. And even after he got over into Egypt, he left his family, y'all remember the story, came into Egypt, or not Egypt, but into uh, uh, the land of Canaan, and God said, all this land will be yours, and I'm going to multiply your seed to where you're going to have so many, it's going to be hard to count them all. As the sand of the sea or the stars in the sky, so numerous shall your seed be. And, and here he is now at 99 years old, and his wife Sarah is 89 years old, and no children. No children. And so here's Abraham, and we'll, we'll pick up here reading. And being not weak in faith... He considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Do you see what, what the picture is there? We're talking about death. And here he is, 99, and he said, my body is dead. And, neither the, and he didn't consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. Well, it's a metaphor of deadness again. But it's the idea that, that uh, uh, they couldn't have children. I mean, it's just, 
they were too old to have children. That's where, just what he's talking about. It didn't, it didn't affect his faith, though, in God, because he knew some, I don't know what it, remember what it was, 25 years, I think it was. I think he was about 75 when God called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. So 24, 25 years earlier, God said, you're going to have a large family, Abraham. And he believed God so much that at 99 years old and his wife 98, and both of their bodies being dead to the idea of having a baby didn't affect him. Because what, what did he know? What did he believe in? God can make the dead alive. Yeah, even in that aspect, in just in, that, in the human aspect of, of, of our reproductive part that had died in those two people, could the doctors have done that? I don't, I, even with, in that day, definitely not. I don't even think in today's world that could have happened. I really don't. Uh, doctors do a lot with that, and, and I'm thankful for some families that want children so bad, and they're able to take certain means medically and have children. What a blessing. Uh, here's Abraham. No children. And yet, uh, uh, he makes the dead. I say no children. We know that, that Isaac was there, but the promised one, that's what, what we're talking about. He makes the dead alive. He, God, is the one that made the dead alive. We couldn't fix it. We have no ability. Because the picture of death that I'm trying to get across, I think you got it. In fact, I'm confident you got it. But is that, this is out of our control. This is out of our reach. This is out of our hand. God makes the dead alive. Well, uh, there's two ideas. We have Jesus bringing Na uh, Lazarus back to natural life and Jairus' daughter. And here we find out that, that uh, these two that, that were unable to have children uh, because their bodies were dead, and God uh, fixed that. Let's look on a little bit farther. I'm having to decide which one I want to go to first. Just give me a second. I hate the quietness, and I'm sorry for this, but... Uh, Well, let's just go to this one. This one we're all familiar with. Ephesians 2, 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now that verse is uh, what primitive Baptist doctrine stands on uh, as far as uh, regeneration is concerned, as far as being born again is concerned. And it uses, uh, you know, the Bible uses a number of different ways of teaching us uh, what uh, uh, the, the aspect of, of being born again. Okay, we'll just use that. But it talks about that we're born again. It talks about that we're quickened. That's a verse we're going to talk about here in a minute, being made alive, that we're dead, made alive. It talks about that we're washed in regeneration, that we've been cleaned up. The different metaphors. You have to have all these metaphors to get a picture of it. Not one of these uh, gives us the, the complete picture of how it is when we're changed from this natural vial and that we're now a child of God, that we've been, we've been regenerated. See another one. I, I don't know what word to use. I don't know how to, how would you explain it? It talks about that we have a new man, a new creature, a regeneration. You see the point? We can't, it's a, such a spiritual aspect that we're stuck to just these natural examples to even try to explain it. And I just did five of them. I'm confident there's more. That's just what's off the top of my head. But one of them is the idea that we're dead. We are dead in trespasses and in sins. It's a, uh, for, for, for human beings to understand this concept of being dead, uh, it's a hard thing. Number one, a person that's not born again can't understand it because it's a spiritual thought. And we learn from the Apostle Paul uh, over in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, For the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither indeed can he know them, because they are spiritually 
discerned. So in other words, before you're born again, you're just a natural man with just a natural mind, with just natural understanding. And if somebody tried to explain to you the spiritual aspect, it's another language. You don't get it. You know, uh, the silly little uh, illustration maybe uh, between a natural man and a spiritual man trying to understand something. Does a dog ever have a desire to meow like a cat? No, it's not its nature. Not its nature at all. It has no desire. I mean, you might train a dog to say something that sounds like meow, but it's not what it is. It's, 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 it's just not its nature. Well, the natural man doesn't have the nature, doesn't have that quality, doesn't have that life of, uh, of being able to understand spiritual things. So just even the idea to, to explain to you people, you folks, that you're dead in trespasses and sins. You're spiritually dead. You're not going to get it at all unless you're born again. You, no, number one, you must be born again to even start to get that picture. You have to have a spiritual nature and a spiritual mind to even get some kind of inkling what we're talking about. Then you've got to understand about in the Garden of Eden and what happened over there when, when God had told uh, uh, Adam not to eat of that tree. Do not eat the fruit of that tree. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Oh, well, now we're back to this metaphor again, aren't we? Did When he bit of that fruit, I don't, uh, they say apple, I'm going to say fruit. Did he just conk over dead? No, no, he was alive. What happened? What happened? It's a spiritual death. He died spiritually. Yeah, we, that verse I just read, uh, for the natural man received not things of the Spirit of God, neither did can, because they're spiritually discerned. So, so we know that he became a natural man, a sinner, and, and died to spiritual things because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Very simple, but yet it's a complex issue to really try to, and thus God opens your eyes to understand that you're dead. And he, God using this metaphor or this idea of dead, you're dead, it's, it's total separation there's, there's, there's a gulf, there's, there's a void in between, uh, between the, uh, the natural man and the spiritual man, or between the natural man and God. It's, it's just there. You can't fix it. We don't have the ability to fix it. No more than any of you can walk out to a graveyard and call somebody to come back alive. Can't do it. I can't call my parakeet back to life that uh, when I was six or eight years old, whenever it was. We just can't get it done. We do not have the ability. And yet, what do we say? God makes the dead alive. And so you go to Ephesians, and, and, and it says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. The dead there means you were totally, 100%, completely separated from God. You're dead to God. You're separated from God. And guess what? You can't fix it. You don't have the ability. Are you alive? Well, yes. Your heart's pumping. You have brain waves going on. It's knowing what you ate a little while ago and sending the correct chemicals into your stomach to digest your food. Things are happening. You're breathing oxygen in. It's, it's enriching your, your blood with oxygen to go through to every cell of your body. And you have life. But concerning a spiritual aspect, before you're born again, you're dead. Completely separated. And yet, in Ephesians there, it says, And you hath he quickened, or made alive. God makes the dead alive. Does he not? That's the only way. Is, to me, that's probably, as far as, as who we are, and, and I don't want to say so much about primitive Baptists, but as far as the doctrine of God teaching his people, and I trust the primitive Baptists are the ones uh, that I believe are holding to it the best I've found. Uh, it'd be foolish of me to say, oh, that other group's doing a better job, but I'm going to stay here. You see what I'm saying? The, 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 the idea that, 
that you are dead. You can't fix it. It's just, it's just a hard, hard concept uh, for, for uh, even born-again people because we know the, the natural man can't receive it. It's like we have to do something. We have to be able. If, if we just make the first step or God steps toward us or, or, and then we step out to him or we, we say, I want to be baptized. Some people think baptism is so you make that decision. Uh, uh, or Satan cast a vote and God cast a vote and you cast a vote. But see, in all of the different pictures that people try to portray, there's already life there. We're talking dead. We're talking 100% complete separation. If, if you're going to take the picture in this spiritual to say there's something that that de spiritually dead person and you hath he quickened who were dead and trespassed and sin, if you're going to take some kind of, of idea there that that person can do something to make themselves alive, then you're going to have to because the picture comes from Lazarus just to put a name on it. That's where the picture comes from. And we're going to have to say, to be fair, you're going to have to say Lazarus could have done something to make himself alive. And we know that's ridiculous. You're all like, come on, preacher, get it. You know, how silly. But it's not that silly. It's a hard concept. But only God does what? Makes the dead alive. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. God makes you alive. It's the only way. It's the only possible way. It's the only way Abraham and Sarah is going to have a baby. It's the only possible way is God makes the dead alive. When my mama, that, that machine started recording that her heart started beating again, God makes the dead alive. It's just the way it is. It's, it's just a fundamental, fundamental, fundamental concept. God makes the dead alive alive. We can do another verse, and I think we should in this category, is uh, John 5, 25. Uh, this is the very words of Jesus. I'll wait a moment while you turn there, because I want you to look at it. John 5, 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. This is talking about being born again. This is talking about, as Paul said over there, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You're, you're alive as a natural man, as I mentioned earlier, breathing, thinking, heart pumping, all that stuff going on, but you're dead spiritually until God speaks and calls your name and, and makes you spiritually alive or borns you again or regenerates you or washes you, whatever you're going to call it. The new creature is planted in you. It's in, in, and I don't want to say, you know, there's some aspects the, the Bible divides that we're a new man and an old man and we have that conflict inside but those other times it says, and, and you're, you are the new man. You are a new man. When God looks at you, child of God, he's looking you, at you through Jesus Christ. Uh, let's say that Jesus Christ is the lens, like in a camera. It, 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 it changes some things maybe a little bit. It filters out some things. Or I had my contacts removed uh, last fall. I had no idea that everything was so yellow till I got those contacts out. Uh, I mean, cat, sorry, I had cataracts removed last fall. And I had no idea that they had gotten so ripe that the, the, the light in our backyard, I thought, was yellow. We bought a house a year and a half ago or two years. And, and the yard light, and I'm like, that's an unusual mercury light because I've never really seen one that's yellow. But it's yellow. Well, I came home the first day getting the first cataract removed and I looked out at that light it's blue I mean what so I cover this eye and look at it no it's yellow it's blue <laughs> it's nuts so well what they're replacing your cataract it's called a lens I mean that's just what it's called put in some plastic things that are clear 
And wow, the world is a, is, a, is a brighter place all of a sudden. Well, when God looks at you, child of God, through the lens of Jesus Christ, he doesn't see any sin. Isn't that beautiful? No sin. So there's a sense in which when God's looking at you, you are a child of God. It's not like a part of you is this and a part of you is that. No, you are a child of God. Rejoice in it. Live in it. Because you have been made. Was there a part, you know, you've been made alive. Was there a part of Lazarus that was still dead when he was made alive? I don't think so. I even think the stink went away that they said was there. Well, it was coming from his body. And if he's... If he's been made whole again, no more smell. There's no aspect, when you're made alive, there's no aspect of you that is dead. So we talk about the natural man being dead and the spiritual man's life. But when God looks at you through the lens of Jesus Christ, he just sees life. All life. It's beautiful. I love to think about these things. So here it is. And it, and it says, Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead, in other words, it's been happening, it's still happening, and when the dead, dead in sin, shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Who he speaks to is going to live. When God said, Lazarus, come forth, who came forth? Lazarus. All right, and when God speaks to one of you little children of God, I know your name, Matthew. Matthew, live. You're alive in Christ. You're just, you're a new man. You're a new creature. You've been washed. You've been born again. You've been made alive. Who can do that? God makes the dead alive. Dead alive. I love it. Those two words together just don't fit, dead alive. But God makes the dead alive. I love it. All right. Well, I think I've pounded on that enough. Let's, uh, let's, let's do something else here. Uh, but let's go to this one next. Uh, we'll just drop down a couple of verses here. Uh, John uh, 5, 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation. There's an hour coming, folks, out in the future, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. We, have, we sing a song. I love that song. It's in these books. And we'll all shout together in that morning. There's a morning coming, and, and I don't know if it's, you know, 6 a.m. here. Uh, it's just the beginning of a new day. That's why it's morning. And Jesus Christ is coming back, and he has all the souls of the saints that's passed. And he's coming back, and, and he's going to, to, with a shout, and all of our bodies, of those of us that's died, are coming up out of the ground, or out of the sea, or wherever, wherever your body's been. From, from, from Adam, I mean, what, 6,000 years ago or so, Where's his dust at? God knows. And it's coming. And it's going to meet God in the air. And those souls and those bodies are going to be reunited. And this mortal, this, this, this corruption, you're looking at me, I'm corrupted. I, I think things I shouldn't think. I, I, I do things I shouldn't do. You know, I lie. Yeah, I do. I, I'm, I'm a proud person sometimes. I want to, you know, I get in some conversations and why is it that all of a sudden it's like, well, I want these guys to think better of me than I really am. And so I say a little white lie, we call it, because we don't want to feel too bad about it to make me look better. God hates that. Do you know that? God hates pride. God hates lying. And here I am doing that. But here, that corruption... That I am that corruption means rottenness, means means putridness. That's what we are. That's that's what total depravity is. Is we we kind of clean it up by saying total depravity. That way we don't really have to think about it. What corruption really means, and the Bible talks about that we are. David talked about it in Psalms 14, saying he looked down through time to see if there were any that did understand any from Adam to the last person on earth. If there was one person on planet earth in all time 
that would ever even try to do something good and think about God. And he says, no, there's not one. They are all together become corrupt. Well, what's corrupt mean? Well, they've all together become totally depraved. Well, we still don't know what we're talking about. They become rotten. They become putrid. This is the rottenness of, of, of well, excuse me, folks. I don't mean to hurt your feelings. It's the rottenness of Lazarus before he came forth. The smelliness, rotten. God, here's another one of those examples, and, and it's in death, so we'll just go there a minute. God is trying to show you and I how yuck we are in his nostrils or his eyes and his thinking. And, and for him to do that, what he's telling you and I is, is that y'all being sinners to him is like you and I seeing a dead corpse that's stinking. And as Job said, my skin worms, it's being eat up. Now that's pretty basic, pretty base, pretty yuck. Is it not? Have you ever heard anything more yuck than that out of the stand? I'm sorry, but it's Bible. Uh, uh, Jesus is, or the Apostle Paul is talking about, uh, Peter is talking about uh, uh, Jesus Christ being incorruptible. Well, what's he talking about? He can't, he, he has no rottenness to him. He has no putridness to him. While he was in the grave, his body didn't see corruption. Do you remember saying that? Well, it means that by his body wasn't decomposing. It's, it's, it talks in there just a verse or two above that. It says that, that uh, uh, King David was, was served his generation and, and that he, he uh, fell on sleep. In other words, he died. And that, and that they buried his body in the tomb. And Peter said, we even know where his tomb's at out here. And his body saw corruption. His body rotted. I mean, that's what we're talking about. It's yuck. But when God looks at us, it's what he sees when he's thinking of us in our natural self. It's deadness. It's deadness. And marvel not at this, for in the hours coming, and they which are in the graves, this yuck body, this, this, this corruptible, what's the scripture say? Must put on incorruption. This yuck is no longer, when Jesus comes back that day, that great day, and he calls all the dead out of the graves, the good and, the, I mean, those, the children of God and the non-children of God. I don't talk much about the non-children of God. Don't think I'm part of it. Just God will take care of that. Uh, I'll say this much. They go to hell, and hell is cast into the lake of fire where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the children of God are reunited, and their bodies are changed to be immortal. Mortal means dying, death. We're death in here with each other is where we're at. But God changes it because what? God makes the dead alive. God makes the dead alive. And he makes this corruptible, this yuckness that we are. The, this putridness is changed to incorruptible. In other words, it's beautiful. It doesn't stink anymore. It, it's not when you stick your hand in the bag of apples and one's rotten and you put your finger in it and get the yuck on you. There's not there anymore. There's no rottenness. It's beautiful. God makes the dead alive. He, this corruptible must put on incorruption. What a beautiful and grand, grand and glorious day. And we're going back. Can you imagine? Can you see when a loved one of mine dies? I try to envision the throne room of God. You remember we talked about God sitting there on his throne. Jesus at his right hand. The, the throne has got a name on it. And it says that it's, it's a, a, a grace. The throne of grace. Do you all ever pray to the throne of grace? We have songs that talk about that. The throne of grace. There God sits on his throne of grace. I think it's Hebrews 2 or Hebrews 4 that talks about, the calls it the throne of grace. There's God. How many million or billion angels are there? I have no idea. But they're all up there praising holy, holy, holy. And then how many children of God have already passed from Adam to now? Billions, I'm guessing. And there's the sea of, of loved souls, of God loved these folks through what Jesus Christ had done. And, and they're praising God, holy, 
holy. And we're going to go there one day, and we will be at that throne. We will see that throne. We'll have, you know, every now and then I get this little few moments. Somebody asked me one time how long it lasted. I said, maybe 18 seconds, you know, I don't know. But you just, just so enwrapped in God's love. And you don't want to leave the place. Have you all ever been there? Maybe it was in this room in a church meeting. Maybe you were just at home and it's just a hard situation in your life. And God just come in and comforted you. And you just, well, multiply that by about 20 billion times. And it'll be what we're feeling in heaven. Remember when Jesus was resurrected and he's walking down the road with those two men on their way to Emmaus and, and the two men don't realize it's Jesus and he speaks to them for a while. And then uh, they get to their home and Jesus, uh, 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 you know, just leaves them. He didn't walk out, just whoop, he's gone. And they realized it was Jesus Christ. And what they say? Did not our hearts burn within us. I love it when the few times in my life I can say I had spiritual heartburn. I loved it. I don't need any Rolades for spiritual heartburn. Don't want it. I want more spiritual heartburn. I want my heart to burn within me thinking about Jesus Christ and what he has done. Oh my goodness gracious. And here's that day that Jesus comes back and he calls those and what it says here uh, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And he's saying, live, live. God makes the dead alive. God makes the dead alive. We, can't, we have no ability. We can't fix it. It is not in our ability. There's just no chance. Is there any way we could, at the resurrection, are you going to raise anybody? <laughs> well, duh, what a dumb question. No. It, 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 a regular graveyard, like where Lazarus was, can you raise anybody? No, can't do it. Could you uh, fix uh, a, a Abraham and Sarah's problem? No. God does it. God makes the dead alive. Well, there's four of them. I saved this one to last. I was going to talk about it earlier. Those are, you know, that, the, the things I've been talking about is getting uh, two points, I guess. The one point is, God makes the dead alive. <laughs> Y'all are going to be so tired of hearing that when I get done. But I want to pound it into your brains. I want you, when you hear something dead, I want you to, in your mind, just say, but God makes them alive. You know, something dies, God makes it alive. God makes the dead alive. All right. And we talked about the natural aspect with Lazarus. We talked about uh, the reproductive aspect with Abraham and Sarah. Uh, we talked about the, the uh, uh, very end time uh, when all that are in the graves uh, shall hear. And we talked about uh, being dead in trespasses and sins. And God quickens you or makes you alive. Uh, the main point in, in all of that is, is that God does it. We don't have the ability. So this last one is more of a practical aspect. It's, it's for us here and now. What, what can we do? What, uh, does this affect us, this idea? Is, is the idea of death and being made alive something that affects us right now here today and we're not actually falling over dead? Uh, and, and it's not in the spiritual sense of being born again. And the answer, of course, is yes, <laughs> or I wouldn't have brought it up. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.6. Run back over to 1 Timothy Here, here the Apostle Paul is giving uh, Timothy some instructions for in the church and how to do things, handle things in the church. And we've got on to the topic of widows and if it's a widow indeed or not and different aspects about widows and what the church's responsibility is. And this one verse I'm just going to snatch out uh, and you'll see why when we read it. 1 Timothy 5, 6. And it's talking about a widow now. And it says, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. This is how I'm going to take that. I'm going to say that this widow woman is a child of God, but she is living in pleasure. I don't think that's complimentary. I think that's a, uh, a nice way of saying she's living an immoral life. We'll go that far with it. 
Y'all can use your minds on the rest of it. So she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. In other words, we was talking a little bit ago. Brain's working, heart's working, lungs working, stomach's working. Everything's working. But there's a deadness. She's dead while she lives because of what she's doing, how she's living her life. You know, when a person dies, I mentioned right off uh, uh, when I started to talk about, about the two worlds and all and how we interact with this world with our five senses. You realize when we have spiritual life, we kind of have spiritual senses that we can, the uh, Bible talks about taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, t- using the natural example of, or, or feeling the Lord or, or understanding uh, that God's good, that we see, we see, you know, seeing sight, light, those things are in the realm of understanding. Understand what God's done for us. We're interacting with God uh, with our spiritual senses. And here it says she's dead while she liveth because of the way she's living her life in pleasure. Uh, well, I want to say her spiritual senses is what's dead. She's not experiencing God. Well, uh, you know, when I look at her and think about her and her situation, it, it seems kind of like a, a permanent thing. I uh, don't like that much. I'd, and I, I want to maybe apply it to me. Well, I never want to get over there. But I'll have to say, as I mentioned a little while ago, when I lie or when I, uh, in pride, try to puff myself up a little bit too much or, you know, whatever else, thoughts that go through my mind that, that God never intended to be in anybody's mind, but it happens. It's who we are. Uh, or I'm jealous of somebody, or I'm envious of something somebody has. All sin. When, when you're in that state, and you get overwhelmed maybe in that state of those, those thoughts or those, those feelings, you realize it's killing. You're in a deadness uh, to those, those spiritual senses. You're not understanding God as well. You're not tasting that God is good. You're not, not able to go up and feel Jesus as, as uh, 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 Thomas wanted to do and, and touch him and hold him or, or the, the woman with the issue of blood and just feel the edge of his garment. You're, the spiritual side, those senses have died is what we're talking about. Uh, another uh, idea of this, and I think you all know this story. It comes from Luke 15. I'm not turning there. Uh, but it's about the prodigal son. You remember the boy that wanted his, his inheritance before his dad died? What, what a, what a, I don't know what the right word is. Crazy son. Hey, dad, you know, uh, when you die, I'm going to get half of this anyway. So why don't you just go ahead and give it to me now? disgraceful to his father oh my goodness you know I don't get the picture that the dad was even you know one foot in the grave as we'd say I think the dad was fine but anyway the dad's gracious gives him half and the boy goes off and blows it y'all remember the story ends up a Jewish boy in a hog pen feeding hogs and so hungry that the slops looking good to him now talk about iron you know irony of ironies uh, there it is and he comes to his right mind. Why did he, how did he come to his right mind? I don't think it was on his fault. I don't think it was on his part whatsoever. Do you not know that the goodness of God is what leads you to repentance? If it wasn't God's goodness leading you, if you have to be led somewhere, why are you being led? You don't know where to go. You know, if I was going to go home with any of you, except my wife and, and my son and the two places that they live, Y'all have to lead me. I know where they live. I can get there on my own. The goodness of God leadeth you to repentance. You don't know even know where repentance is without God leading you to change you from this, this aspect. Maybe this woman that was living in pleasure. I hope and pray that maybe she was led of God and she left that uh, area. But anyway, God's leading the prodigal son and he comes to his right mind and he says, I'm not worthy to be a son anymore. I've died to that aspect. I know that. I'm not a son. If, if my father will just accept me just to being a servant, will be way better than I got. So he goes home. 
Do you remember what the father says as he's heading home? When, he, when the father stand on the edge of the land and watching for him, and what does the father say? For this my son was dead and is alive again. This my son was dead and is alive again. Did the son die in the hog pen? I mean, did he, did he fall over dead? No. It was dead to fellowship. It was dead to fellowship. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the woman living in pleasures dead while she lives. We're talking about dead to fellowship. Fellowship with God. Well, in the case with the prodigal son, it's dead in, in fellowship to his father. And here he comes, and it's dead. Can the boy make the dead alive? Can he restore himself to fellowship? Does that boy have that power? Who has the power to do it? That's my question. It's, it's the father. It's the father that's, that says, you know, the boy said, I'm not worthy to be a son. Maybe my daddy will even just let me be a servant. See, the boy put the idea in the right spot. Who makes the dead alive? It's the father. And in this case, in, a, in this natural example that Jesus is giving, it's the father that made, restored him back to fellowship and called him a son. He said, this my son that was dead, in other words, separated in fellowship, is now alive. We're back. He's back. We're going to have fellowship. And they killed the fatted calf, and they had a party. And they, the, the father was so happy that he had returned. God makes the dead alive, even with you and I, when we stray away and we, we die to fellowship to God. It happens to all of us. Uh, the only reason I know it happens to all of us is because you all are human and you all sitting here alive in front of me. <laughs> so that's, that, that's inclusive, all inclusive. So let's go to one last point. I know it's 12 and uh, we're just finished to wrap this up. So uh, in... in, in uh, uh, in David's, King David's life, y'all remember that he wasn't out fighting in the time that the kings were, were fighting. I don't exactly know what that means. I guess there were seasons of the year that uh, if you was going to be have neighbor with your neighboring country, uh, you did it during the, that season. But anyway, David wasn't there. He was at home, and he saw Bathsheba. Y'all remember the story? And he uh, sins with Bathsheba, and to try to cover the sin... He, uh, he has her, her husband come home, and uh, that didn't work, so he sends him back, has the man murdered. What a sweet guy David is, isn't he? Do you think David right now is dead to fellowship with God? Yeah, pretty much. I can prove it. We can prove it. Let's go there. Let's go to uh, uh, Psalms 51. Psalms 51. Here's David. He thinks he's got away with it. He's feeling probably kind of smug about it. But he's dead in fellowship to God. He's dead. He's separated from God. No fellowship with God. When I get in that position, like I told you a little bit ago, I know I'm away from God. I've sat in a church meeting, and I can just tell the Spirit of God is in the room, and people are rejoicing. You may see some people smiling big smiles at just how great God is. You may look at a sister across the room and tears of joy coming down her face. And I've sit like right there on the front row and I'm cold as an ice cube. I can see it happening around me and I am not feeling it. I'm dead to fellowship. That's what it is. Dead to fellowship. How do you get from dead to fellowship to in fellowship? Because God makes the dead alive. Thank you very much. And even in the practical sense, that is, is what I'm trying to talk to us now. So let's run here. David, remember now, here he's, here he's sinned with Bathsheba. Here he's had her husband murdered and, and he thinks he's got away with it. Nathan, the prophet comes, explains that story about the rich man and the poor man and the one sheep and all that, remember. And then Nathan said, thou art the man, David, it's you. And David now realizes he's the sinner. It's his fault. And so he writes Psalms 51. Here's David in that point, much as the prodigal son coming home, wondering, will my dad even accept me as a servant? Wondering. I've, David's saying, I've messed up so bad as, 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 as a child of God, 
Will he ever accept me? Let's read a good bit here of Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou, hast, uh, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. What does restore mean? Make new again. Bring it back to life again. If you have an old clunker car that's got all rusted down, I mean, it's a mess out there. Windows broke, dented in, and you restore it, and you can drive it down the road again, you've brought it back to life. David is saying, I have sinned, God. The prodigal son said, Father, I've sinned and not worthy to be called your son anymore. I, we have sinned, all of us have sinned, and we're dead. We are dead to fellowship with God, and we can't fix it. We don't have the ability. The same as Lazarus, the same as, 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 as Abraham and Sarah, the same as all of those in the graves at that last great day. The same as our spiritual life. We can't fix it. But God can make the dead alive. Did God restore fellowship with David? He did. David wrote some beautiful things. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. There's some fellowship with God there, wouldn't you say? I think so. God makes. Thank you. God bless you all. I've enjoyed this time. Praise God.